Hi, my name is John Doggett. I've been on Macomb's faculty since 1989, teaching courses about global competition, entrepreneurship, and sustainability, uh, based on a lot of the work I've done as a serial entrepreneur and consultant, working in countries, about 30 countries around the world. Today, I'm really excited by the opportunity to have a conversation with Admiral Bob Inman, who has done more things uh, in his life than most of us will ever even dream about. Uh, we're going to talk about threats facing this world, things going on uh, in other countries, and understand this. There are very large agencies all over the world that have people working on this 24-7, and we're going to try to see what we can do in about 45 minutes. So I want to welcome all of you for joining this uh, conversation between the Admiral and myself, mm -hmm. uh, especially our friends from various uh, foreign intelligence agencies around the world, because we know you wouldn't miss an opportunity like this. Admiral, welcome to the, the show. Thank you. So there are a lot of things that are going on, but you know, one of the things that's on the top of most people's list is we have two leaders of China and Russia who seem to want to become leaders for the rest of their life. Is that unusual? What do you think about that? We have been accustomed over centuries of having monarchs reign for a great many years. But countries that presume to have to be democracies uh, rarely go beyond um, eight, ten years for the chief executive. We're seeing that violated right now in Turkey, where Erdogan is orchestrating. Uh, we don't know how long he's going to serve, and and a number of other countries as well. But the key ones, because they are our biggest strategic competitors, are Russia and. China. Putin has just engineered in the last week getting the vote on the constitutional changes, which used to limit the president to two terms. He did two, handed it off to Medvedev, came back, did two more. That's He did, isn't required to hand off anymore. He can now serve till 2036. She uh, inherited a process put together by Deng Xiaoping, which had uh, the, the maximum leader serve two terms, five years each, so a total of 10 years. And after his first term, uh, instead of bringing younger people onto the Politburo, uh, he appointed people who were close to his age. And then he very shortly thereafter changed the limitation on the presidency. There had been no limitation on Secretary General of the Party and Chairman of the Military Commission. So he now can stay as long as he wants. What that says is that thinking long-term of where they want to be, what they want to accomplish, they both have a very long horizon. And for the US, long-range thinking is next Thursday. <laughs> So the challenge that this faces for us is we now have competitors, and I'll use that word, who don't have to worry about the next election. They don't have to worry about power sharing. What they need to worry about is how do they maximize the strength of their countries uh, while they still are you know, competent to, to lead the countries. Uh, what do we do? And how do we respond to that? Because we're not going to change our legal system. There there are multiple different answers, John, to it. Um, all the way back to the early years after World War II, when the US put in place a national security structure for planning and making decisions. Truman didn't particularly like it. It was sort of forced it on him by Congress and by Clark Clifford. Uh, Eisenhower had always wanted something like it. It was really solidified in his time. And presidents have varied in how much they wanted to engage in it, but all of them used it until this administration. And, uh, you know, you had um, what, four national security advisors, a lot of rotation in the national security uh, staff structure, and a lot of changes in cabinet positions. So the end result, there has not been a stability 
of players <coughs> focused for uh, looking at strategic problems, long-term problems. So they spend most of their time, as best I can tell it, fighting fires. And obviously, COVID-19 has made that more complex, more difficult than it might have been. In a dialogue, uh, ongoing dialogue I have with Chinese, uh, last July, when I was in Beijing, the, one of the professors at Central Party School said, you know, Admiral, it won't surprise you that we track the U.S. policymaking process very carefully. And it doesn't appear to us that this administration is using that process at all. And I had a one word answer, perceptive. Yes. Well, we're gonna have an election in November and I'm not gonna ask you to make any estimates of when, uh, what's gonna happen then, but it'll be very interesting to see how the American people respond to uh, all the things that are going on. You mentioned COVID-19. Let's talk about it from an international global standpoint. How significant is it? And, yeah. and in your lifetime, have you ever seen anything like COVID-19? John, when I'm doing a normal Inman's view of the world and I go through threats, nuclear proliferation, terrorism, cyber, narcotics trafficking, for at least 15 years, pandemic epidemics has been listed. That's going all the way back to what we saw with SARS back in 2003. And my question always was, were the world health organizations ready to deal with a large scale pandemic? And we know the, now know the answer, absolutely not in the process. And it varies greatly country by country, region by region. Uh, some were better prepared to deal with it than others. Um, a World Health Organization is supposed to coordinate all those activities. Uh, let's just say they did not earn great plaudits for their early handling of it. Um, it's pretty easy to turn and blame them for all the rest of it when a lot of our own slowness of actions added to the problems. Why this one is so much more complex to try to deal, to contain it after it had already vastly spread, the response here, most other countries, was to shut down the economy entirely, lock down, stay at home. So we had the kind of dramatic collapse of jobs that we haven't seen since the time of the Great Depression in the 30s. Um, the huge issue is what's the recovery time coming out of it? Yep. And that depends on how long it runs. Uh, there was optimism six weeks ago as New York was beginning to dig its way out of being the worst hit uh, state. Uh, <clears throat> many of the other countries had had the companies, many of the other states had had relatively small numbers of cases. And then we've seen a spiraling. In trying to understand this and looking at other countries where they also had evidence, but got on top of it quickly, uh, South Korea, Vietnam, Thailand, um, oh, wow. to some degree, Norway, Denmark, Finland. The answer, as best I can discern it, is that the public in all those cases was attuned to a, all collectively responding, all going into lockdown. The, the Asians had already used flu, uh, face masks regularly, just yeah. dealing with colds and influenza. And the sort of surprising, disappointing factor for me in this country is the significant number of people who've ignored social distancing and face mask as an infringement on their inherent rights. And John, I have to tell you, I don't think they have an inherent right to particularly potentially expose me to COVID-19. Yeah. So it comes down to individuals having at least some concern 
for the rest of the their community, their state, their family, their country. And the absence of that, particularly visible in the 20-year-olds, early 30-year-olds, who as soon as they could, as soon as the bars were opened, they flocked to the bars and ignored all of the precautions. And what we've seen in all the places where that occurred is a surge. So I'm I'm a little, I was earlier optimistic six weeks ago that we were going to get this under control. We'd see the economy coming back in uh, August, September. Uh, now I'm much more pessimistic uh, as the surge goes on, unless there is a significant change in the behavior of 99% of the U.S. population. Uh, we aren't going to have it under control, and we're not going to have a, an economy resuming. And so it could be three or four years. And if you go that long, the deep damage to the economy, we know looking back at the 30s model, says you'll be feeling it for a decade. Yeah, We're not yet at the point that it's not recoverable, but we're talking now days and weeks. And if we go into mid-August and there is not a substantial reduction underway, then then we're in for a very tough ride. My wife and I uh, drove out to the hill country over the weekend and we were near Canyon Lake uh, and came across some tubers, inner tubers, getting ready to get on the Guadalupe River. And what stunned us was a line about three quarters of a mile long with men and women in their swimming suits with their tubes as close as you physically could get to each other. And not a single one of them had masks. And then when we looked yeah. at the river, the river was packed with tubers. Nobody's wearing masks. So I think, Admiral Bob, the challenge we have is very simple. There are a lot of Americans who simply don't believe this is a real problem. They say, It's not just a question of their rights. They just don't think they need to worry about it, that they're immune, that they are the invincibles. Uh, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. So the implications for this from a, both an economic uh, standpoint and a uh, uh, political standpoint are pretty dire. Well, I think the Congress is going to get their act together over the next two weeks, uh, recognizing that we're not near the end. Uh, I don't know what another uh, package will look like, how broad it will go, how deeply it will reach. Um, given the scale of unemployment, uh, the fact that uh, people have been able to still purchase food, that there have been ready supply of food bank handout has kept us from having the kind of disaster uh, that could occur. Um, but you do have to worry for a long time, long term, John. Um, does debt matter? And at the rate that we're piling it up, um, as long as interest rates are practically zero, uh, it's not that big a deal. The Federal Reserve still has some more firepower. Uh, it's interesting that on the financial side, uh, they've not had nearly the number of people take up loans that they were prepared for. But uh, I don't like seeing a lot more added to the Fed's balance sheet. Well, I'm, I'm not excited about that. I've been an anti-debt person for a long time, but there's another twist to this. Aren't we as a country more vulnerable strategically uh, from the perspective of competitors than we've ever been? Because we have so many people unemployed, we have the government printing all this money, we have all the stimulus programs, we have people not taking COVID-19 seriously, if you were a competitor to the United States, wouldn't this be a great time to make a move? The, I think at this point, none of the major strategic competitors are inclined to uh, do anything that might escalate it into an armed conflict. But they'll continue to look for advantage. Uh, who would have thought five years ago that Putin would be the arbiter of what's going to happen in Syria. He's increasingly looks like he's the arbiter 
to decide what's going to happen in uh, Libya. Uh, he's involved in sustaining Maduro in Venezuela. So he's playing an international game and thus far playing it pretty well. Xi's game has been much more on the economic side. Uh, it, driven initially by guaranteeing the availability of raw materials critical for the Chinese economy and markets for Chinese goods, services in the process. Um, he's sort of at a junction now. Uh, does he try to go beyond that status and become the kind of arbiter of events going on that Putin is clearly trying to be? I don't worry about Russia and China be, being allied against us. They've got too many uh, divisive features between them, but China needs Russian oil. And so that's what keeps things reasonably peaceful there. The long-term problem here, uh, she's Belt and Road Initiative to go do infrastructure all over the Middle East, all over Asia, all over Africa, uh, to help ensure access to markets and access to raw materials. Almost all of that has been done on loans, not grants. Yep. And a large number of nations that already were uh, not prepared to service that scale of debt. Now put COVID-19 on top of that. And if they default, you know, as we've seen in Sri Lanka, taking over a port to be a, a, a transshipment place for China and maybe a naval base eventually, uh, Djibouti. Um, do we see them taking advantage to have physical presence that would let them deploy military power elsewhere? No sign of it happening yet, but it's clearly something to watch closely. Well, you know, mentioning Sri, La Sri Lanka, we have seen the transition from a loan program to the Chinese saying, you can't afford to service the loan. We'll convert it into a 99-year lease, and at the end of the lease, we'll give you the port back. Uh, yeah. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. But you mentioned Venezuela, and that's the question that's come up by a lot of people. It's in our backyard. Is the Monroe Doctrine, which says anything that happens in the Western Hemisphere is the U.S. business, is it dead? I mean, have we basically ceded Venezuela to the Russians and the Chinese? Or are we going to do something about the disaster that's going on in Venezuela? I think hovering over considerations about Venezuela or Iraq and Afghanistan and the view that we plunged into those militarily, Afghanistan to respond to 9-11, but then we went far beyond that, nation building, and Iraq um, to remove Saddam Hussein. Um, the option to go use force to remove Chavez and now Maduro, I think it simply wasn't an option administrations, whether it was uh, the previous one or this one, uh, didn't see congressional support or political support mm -hmm. for using force to make the change. So what do you hope for? You hope that the country's military will see the destruction of the economy that's occurring and will depose them. Why didn't that happen? Because about 15 years ago, international mafia looking for new markets, watching the money the cartels were making by shipping drugs to the US, concluded there must be underserved markets. So they set up shifting, going from across Colombia to Venezuela, off to Africa, up into Europe, and they found huge markets in the process. And to guarantee that access across Venezuela, they had a steady flow of money to the senior military people to protect it. So in the absence of some other way they're gonna get wealthy, they're not gonna give up that 
stream yeah. they've got to kick out the guy who leaves them there at the trough. Yeah. Uh, so then that raises this question, Bob. Our competitors are looking at what we're doing in our backyard with Venezuela. They're sensing that the American people are tired of war. We've been in our longest war in our history with Afghanistan, and they don't want to do any more. Our economy is teetering on the brink of serious recession to possibly depression. We're borrowing money or printing money as fast as possible. What message does that send to our allies in Japan, our South Korea, our Taiwan, or the, or the South China Sea, for example? Does that give them a sense of the U.S. will be there if they need us, or does that give them a sense of, oh my goodness? As I continue to read and continue some dialogue with uh, acquaintances, old friends, scattered across a lot of those countries, some in the intelligence business, some outside in the business world. Uniformly, they are all concerned about the U.S. withdrawal from its engagement with the rest of the world. Business is still active, but all the signals from government are withdrawal. Come back to Fortress America, um, walk away from, quote, globalization, unquote. Um, and uh, it's left them all unsure. Uh, what role is the U.S. prepared to play a role? And if the U.S. isn't going to play a role of leadership, then who? Yeah. Um, European Union, Mr. Macron up to the challenge, because Mrs. Merkel, who might have been, is getting ready to retire. Um, we're at almost at the end of Prime Minister Abe's tour in Japan. He's done on balance a very good job, yep. but he's just about the end of his time. So as you look around for potential global leaders, none's visible. And I, I'm tired of hearing how the U.S. has been raped by all the other countries for so long. Forward deployment was less expensive given the underwriting than basing in the U.S. Yep. So the alternative, if you don't want to take care of those facilities, you're not going to spend the money to build new bases in the U.S. It means you're going to reduce the size of your forces which will correspond with deciding you do not want to play a significant role in the world. I'm not advocating that the U.S. ought to be the policeman of the world. That's the last thing we need. But the stability, big word for me, stability created in economic activity by alliance NATO, alliances in the Pacific, uh, have had an awful lot to do with not only booming economies, but the availability to people who are just above the poverty line, but they're going to shop and they can find high quality goods at prices they can afford at Walmart, Target at all. Almost all of those are made in foreign countries as part of this, how you spread of efficiency, productivity. So as we suddenly talk about wanting to bring all that back to the U.S., where's the qualified labor? What's the cost? Will those goods at that same price still be available to the consumers? And the answer is almost certainly no. Yeah. You know, there is this belief that, well, if it's a little more expensive, we can afford to spend the money uh, because we want to make it in America. And I understand that. But that is an attitude of people who have excess disposable income. And as many of us know, there are a lot of Americans who are living paycheck to paycheck. And if their cost of living goes up three or four or five percent, it's going to be a catastrophe. Now, layer on to that, this massive unemployment that we've seen because of COVID-19, it seems pretty difficult. So what would you do? Now, this is a very difficult question, Bob. But I'm a great genie, and I've decided that you're going to run the country for the next two years. What would you do differently? Well, first, 
the thing that makes that idea most impractical is I am 89. <laughs> but a, but an advantage of being 89. But I'm a genie, and so I'm going to make you 79. So boom, okay. it's done. I I remember with a lot of clarity the last five years of the Great Depression when we were living in pretty abject poverty at that stage of the game. And it was World War II that opened the doors, brought us out of it and moved us on to middle class standing ultimately in uh, some prosperity for me and my own family. The, well, what I remember, we didn't have cable news or social media, we had the radio and hearing radio broadcast of what was happening in Europe. As you had the burning of books and the great rallies and the rest. And what I, what I learned from that and then from studying history, the U.S. had turned inward in the 30s because of our own economic distress. And we took no involvement, no action, overwhelmingly publicly popular in what was happening in the rest of the world. Japan moving militarily from Korea on into China. Uh, Hitler moving into Poland and first to Austria, then uh, Czechoslovakia. And the end result with the U.S. sitting on the sidelines, not getting involved, saying that's right was we ended up in a world war. Yeah. And so that history uh, worries me a lot that if we don't engage and try to help manage uh, and maintain a peaceful world, then um, our kids or grandkids are likely to find themselves back in a pretty brutal fight. We have time for another question from me, and then we could go to Q&A from our viewers. The Chinese have just announced that they plan to put a colony on the moon by the year 2036. And I've been following Chinese military pronouncements since the late 90s, and they've very clearly stated they're going to launch people into orbit, which they've done. They're going to put a man on the moon, and then they're going to put a colony on the planet on, on, on the moon by the middle of the next oh. next decade. <clears throat> so here's my question. If the Chinese are able to colonize the moon before we do, isn't that game over militarily? Yeah, I'm <clears throat> are they able to put uh, people on the moon? Are they able to um, establish uh, an operating base, maybe over time. Colonizing the moon is uh, a bridge too far from well, where they are. So They've got the capability. I, I know they probably the, the ambition to do it, but I remember some of those same people uh, saying to me six, seven years ago that China was going to pass the U.S., as the world's largest economy by 2015 or 2020 at the latest. And then we woke up and began to compete again in the process. Um, and if we, in fact, get our act together now in dealing with COVID and the resource, we can remain the leading economic power in the country. There's a new book by Bob Gates called Exercise of Power. And he goes through uh, the eight different presidencies, most of whom he served in, in one role or another. And he makes a big point that we talk about, we tend to think just about military power and how much economic power, the dollar as the current reserve currency of the world, uh, foreign aid, health aid, other things, how all of those come together. Uh, he doesn't refer to them as soft power, uh, as Joe and I used to. He refers to them simply as elements of power. Yep. And on the occasions when administrations have seen fit to marshal those elements, outcomes usually have been positive. You know, one of the things that 
I want to talk about, and then we're going to go to the questions, is the immigration decisions about H-1B visas, about F-1 student visas. And so here's my hypothesis. I'd like you to respond to this. I believe that the most efficient uh, expenditure of dollars for national security for the United States is to encourage as many students from around the world to come to the United States, to go to school at a university, to be infected with our way of doing business, our value system, and then send them back home. What do you think of that hypothesis? Well, I'd like to keep some of them here. Uh, <laughs> some of the ones who are turned out to be the brightest innovators. You know, I've been a trustee of Caltech for 30 years. Okay. And what I learned from interacting with the faculty in the sciences, um, uh, the Chinese graduate students they have, they consider some of the very best at helping them push the frontiers in research. So they're exceedingly reluctant to see any cutback. But standing back and looking at poor decisions, when we made the decision to embark on international supply chains, global approach to manufacturing just in time, what we did not do was put in place the ability to retrain the workers who were going to be displaced to go do the jobs we needed in the evolving industries. And we solved instead by H-1B visas, bringing in very bright uh, youngsters from India, other countries, who turned out to be terrific coders and on beyond that to do many other things. Um, the failure to have focused on <clears throat> retraining U.S. workers to do help put us in the direction of the deficit we have now, the income inequality, is a direct reflection yeah. of that. Not at the very top, that's tax issue, but broadly for the bulk of the economy. Um, the, we are a nation of immigrants. I've watched waves of immigration in my lifetime. And whenever we got one, um, whether it was from Vietnam after the collapse of that war, whether it was coming from Mexico, wherever, first generation scrambled but became self-sustaining. Difference was they had papers. They had a potential path to citizenship. And suddenly when Mexico had its terrible uh, recession in 96, 97, um, what we got was a large exodus of people into the US with, with no papers. And we moved to 11, 12 million people undocumented. And unlike those earlier immigrants whose children spoke English and third generation went on to be professionals, uh, challenge here is because they did not assimilate fear of arrest, fear of being shipped out. Then we have now a whole new underclass of people without the same education skills. And this is where, again, it's the next generation, the generation after that, where we pay the terrible price of talent we didn't get or keep. Finally, on, I have to be a little careful on this one. <laughs> we opened up the doors in 79 for Chinese students to come to the US. And they came in the hundred thousands category, a couple hundred thousand in the first group. Amazing number of them were children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews of people who were in the central committee, people who were running the country, came to get a better education. And that has continued. Um, most have gone back. But there are now people who understand the U.S. and want to dialogue with the U.S. that was not there before we had that pretty large economy of people who'd studied in the U.S. And that's, as an old intelligence officer, that's probably as far as I should go in developing that issue. <laughs>
Well, what really frustrates me when I listen to our colleagues in Silicon Valley arguing for more and more H-1B, more and more H-1 uh, international students being allowed to stay, and I want them to stay. I have plenty of friends who are coming from various parts of the world. I never hear Silicon Valley talk about its responsibility to training Americans to be competitive. Yeah. Uh, and it's just such a short term, you know, we protect their stock options, screw America. And it's really unfortunate. So here's the first question from the audience. Hong Kong. China is moving aggressively with this new national security law, with this new national security agency. Uh, made some, uh, it's told the Taiwanese representatives that they will not get their visas renewed in Hong Kong unless they agree that there's only one China and Taiwan's part of it. What the heck is going on now? From the Chinese perspective, Mrs. Thatcher returned Hong Kong at the end of its lease to be part of China. But to get her to do that, they guaranteed that Hong Kong could keep its own economy mm -hmm. in the process. Uh, one country, two systems. Um, it's the younger generation agitating for independence, breaking that line of being one country that escalated and then the violence, all the rest of it. And that's what drove the new law. Um, where Hong Kong is, where uh, Taiwan's concerned. Uh, after the exchanges in 79, when President Carter shifted recognition from Taiwan to Beijing. Uh, nonetheless, one country, but two economies. That worked reasonably well until we got to, I guess, 2000, when an uh, outsider was elected, Chen Shuben, and he was making noises about um, independent. And that's when China began planning what they would do militarily to keep that from happening. Uh, fast forward, we got eight pretty good years from President Ma Taiwan, who had been mayor of Taipei and a very effective one, where relationships with China were substantially changed, commercial ties, tourists flowing back and forth. And then it shifted back again and the lady who won, um, again, talks now and again about independence. And then she managed to get through for a direct conversation with President-elect Reagan, uh, President-elect Trump, when he was still sitting in New York. And that really rattled the cage. Didn't have any history, didn't have any knowledge. Took the call. And it raised the specter that, again, she was going to go to independence in the process. So it's that fear of independence that drives both China, both Hong Kong and Taiwan problems. Add on top of that South China Sea, China's expansion of uh, their territorial claims, potentially to claim the entire South China Sea, and that you can see where this could evolve into military conflict. Going back to your initial question, my sense is that what the students were after, they wanted to precipitate a Tiananmen Square kind of event in Hong Kong that they believed would then marshal all the support needed to move for independence as opposed to the present status. So um, it's not unusual for people growing up to adulthood and governing, not liking the governance system that their parents and grandparents have been part of and wanting to change it, which always have to measure what's the risk and what's the real gain from the change. So we're early in how Hong Kong's gonna play out. Uh, if we don't see demonstrations and things sort of calm down on the streets, 
My sense is that most of the businesses, foreign businesses operating out of Hong Kong will stay because it's very lucrative and very lucrative access to Asian markets. Okay, last question before we have to stop. And for you viewers, if you think this has been of value, uh, let us know, because we can always uh, have another session sometime in the future. Here's my last question from a number of our uh, alumni from Mexico. Mexico's facing some real significant challenges. COVID-19 is just one of them, but the explosion of narco violence is a bigger one. Is Mexico on the verge of becoming a failed state? What's Mexico's future from your perspective? There have been several chances in the last 40 years when Mexico had, could have slid into a failed state. Uh, the economic collapse in 96, when the US came to rescue with a package of over $30 billion that kept them from going into default. They paid it all back with interest. Uh, deep recession, we got a surge of illegals into the US, but things stabilized and the economy began to grow. Um, the extent of the narcotics uh, violence of the cartels uh, began to be really evidence about 18 years ago. And they've become almost a state within a state in that and every now and again, they demonstrate their ability to control. So whoever served as president has had a challenge in trying to balance getting a recovering economy going and trying to keep the nar narcos from running the entire country. And that all, Dissatisfaction with that led to a big vote um, July two years ago uh, for, it'll be three years now coming up this time, for um, AMLO, Mr. Lopez Obrador, on his fourth try, far over leftist general view, and he was going to take uh, Mexico off socialism. Well, in fact, uh, to my great surprise, um, he's tinkered around the edges of the economy, but largely has supported it and let uh, them continue to go. Mexico is back at a stage where they are competitive. If you look for uh, wanting to continue efficient supply chains, but not have them oceans halfway around the world away, Mexico's increasingly more attractive. So it then comes back to political stability. And um, previous president told us that he could never solve the cartel problem in Mexico unless we could reduce the demand in the U.S. And it is the fact that that demand remains as high as ever. I put that up parallel to what we were talking about earlier about defiance of standards for social distancing and masks and the rest we're seeing now. And uh, that demand produces such a torrent of cash south. Uh, but it also does fund a lot of activities in the process. So, no, I don't think Mexico is at this point on the verge of a failed state, but it is a troubled state not reaching anything approaching its potential because of its inability to control and expunge the narcotics trafficking. So we have a few more minutes. So, so here's a follow-up question. If we look at Colombia, it was a narco state. They seem to have had a reasonable amount of success in making a transition in part, as you said, because the narco said it's easy to do business in Venezuela. But there is a group of people who believe that if we completely legalize drugs or decriminalize drugs in the United States, that the violence of the narcos in Mexico and on the border is going to disappear. Do you agree with that? And they probably also believe in the tooth fairy. <laughs> um, the... Um, and I mentioned Bob Gates' book earlier. Yeah. Uh, 
he's got a great chapter on Colombia and on Plan Colombia and gives broad credit, cross party lines, cross decades for the efforts that helped Colombia turn around. But they still produce lots of narcotics. Yep. But it's a far more stable country, democracy working reasonably well. So we're back to this fundamental issue. Can you really expunge uh, as long as there is a huge market in the U.S. eager to buy? And when pot was finally legalized in Colorado, going out to the ski slopes and all of the snowboarders who were now comfortably puffing up on the slopes, not down hidden away in the back. Um, they were not buying from the official shops because what they could buy from the dealers was cheaper. So uh, legalizing, going to different process, it has not dramatically reduced the volume coming in, though they, in some cases, have moved to more profitable methamphetamines and all along the way. So the, the advocates that if you just legalize it all, you get rid of your problems are uh, far too optimistic. And I would add to it, if you have men and women who are used to making billions of dollars tax-free uh, and having complete control of how they earn and, and use that money, uh, they're not, not going to happen. They're not going to give it up. Uh, final yeah. question. This actually is going to be the final question. What's the biggest cyber threat our country faces? The most sophisticated cyber threat is the Russian one. And it's very keenly developed, widespread. Um, the largest is the Chinese. The primary difference is that the Chinese have used theirs overwhelmingly over the years for industrial espionage. Going and getting the secrets, the rest of it, that will let them grow their own economy. Uh, Russia's has been different. It's continued, you know, all the way back to Stalin, we used to watch active measures as they would go and meddle in other economies with covert operations. I was dazzled by the speed with which they recognized the opportunities that social media offered. And we now know pretty clearly, not just the interference in the 2016 election, but their interference in violence uh, at Ferguson, Sending different messages, get the far left out, get the far right out, get them in a fight. Uh, did the same thing at Charlottesville. I suspect if we ever get the full story, we'll find that they helped incentivize groups that turned to violence out of the Black Lives Matter demonstration, which had a clear purpose. The clear purpose wasn't violence. That's against the fundamental principles from Martin Luther King and John Lewis and so many others. Um, so we know they tried in 18, but got blocked. And the details of that are still classified, but it's a good story. Uh, and there's an announcement I noted from the commander of the uh, US Cyber Command, Director NSA, uh, simply saying that if anybody tried to interfere with our election, they should expect an offensive response from the U.S., which is one of the most encouraging things I've heard thus far for maybe discouraging what could occur Amen. in the process. Um, but don't, I, while I focus on Russia and China, North Korea's developed substantial capability. Iran has a big capability. There are others that aspire to it. So uh, we have to recognize our vulnerabilities. Uh, the degree to which we rely on um, satellites for surveillance and for communications. 
uh, so many other things that are vulnerable to cyber interruption. When I see probing of the US uh, air control system, uh, I wonder, is that a foreign state looking for what they might do? Is it looking for potential terrorists? Okay. Uh, the same thing for dealing with the electrical grid, which we see. So the US as the largest economy also may have the largest series of vulnerabilities for cyber assault and cyber theft. Well, there's just so much more we could talk about, but we've run out of time. We've actually gone over time and I'm sure our listeners and our viewers aren't gonna mind spending a few extra minutes listening to uh, what we've been talking about, but we're gonna have to stop. Admiral, I really appreciate your time. I've known you for decades now, and I've just continued to be amazed that you claim to be as old as you are because that's not possible. <laughs> you Thank heard. you, John. My wife says I fish for compliments shamelessly. Well, guess that's what? Right. There's nothing wrong with that. But yeah. I appreciate your time and energy. Hope that you and your family uh, stay well during COVID and uh, look for an opportunity to do this again. So, and for our viewers, this is John Doggett and Admiral Bob Inman from the University of Texas at Austin. We truly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.